Um, thanks for the introduction of the beauty on duty. I, I, I had a buddy one time who was a car dealer, and uh, that's what they always said. The next guy up for the next customer on the lot was the beauty on duty. So I picked that up, and, and I use it. The, the beauty part of it's a little bit of a stretch, uh, but I'm on duty. And I'm glad to be here today, Pastor Josh and, and Aaron are in Nashville. They're going to another church this morning where they've been in a seminar uh, the last few days. And uh, so I was scheduled to be here today with you, and I'm glad for that. I, in, in preparing to, to preach once out of many weeks, I, I, I find that I've got about 17 sermons that I want to uh, want to share with you today, but I felt like the Lord prompted me to go to back to something that was born out of two particular experiences in my life uh, that kind of cemented some vision for what the church was supposed to be. And back in the day, I uh, spent a lot of time in British Columbia. I would go, I was in, basically stationed in Phoenix, but I would go to British Columbia every summer and work uh, from, from Vancouver and over into Vancouver Island. And we did a lot of outdoor meetings and, and ministered around churches and different things like that. But one year when I was up there, uh, three of us preachers uh, went to a place called Rivers Inlet. And all being fishermen, we were looking forward to this. That this place is a world-renowned fishery for salmon. And the, the, the note of this particular place was you'd catch 40, 50, and even 60-pound salmon, king salmon. And I was all about that. And so we, we gathered together and we made plans, and it was quite a long trip. I had to trailer a boat from Vancouver all across on the ferry over to Vancouver Island and then drive about pretty close to 80 to 100 miles up the island, launch the boat and take it another 60 miles to, to the northern point of Vancouver Island where these preachers were going to fly in and we were going to go across 45 miles of open ocean over to a place called Rivers Inlet and then 15 miles back into this place where we were going to camp. And uh, it was really rough country, very, very remote. And we, we stayed on this old abandoned cannery that had been there before, but had been destroyed in a tidal wave in the Alaskan earthquake back in the 50s. And so we were so excited to do this trip. And we were pretty seasoned salmon fishermen, and we were looking forward to this. And we, we began to fish, and we fished for five days solid and caught not one single fish. I mean, it was just absolutely devastating. I and mean, we were all pretty seasoned, and we could not believe it. And the morning came that we had to leave. And so it, that day was, had some really weird weather. I mean, literally, it was, it was just a cloud cover lowered down to, the, to almost uh, uh, ground level. And it was, there was not a breath of wind. There was barely a little bit of sunlight coming through, so it was kind of an ethereal-looking day. And we were, we were taking this 15-mile this ride out to the open ocean, and it, you couldn't see any, any landmarks. You couldn't tell the difference between sky and ocean because the sky was reflecting in this placid water. It was just the weirdest look. It looked like we were just in a bubble of some sort. And we were going out there. We couldn't see any landmarks. We were just following a heading, a compass heading to get out of that river system into the open ocean. And like some kind of a specter out in the, out in the mist, there was a dot. And we, as we proceeded forward, it finally, finally was a boat. You could see a boat. And as we got closer and closer and closer, you could see a lot of activity on the back deck of this fishing boat. It had a big spool on the back of it. It was a gill netting boat, and, and it was revolving. And we could see these guys were busy running around. And, and as we got closer, we could see one after another these 30, 40, 50-pound salmon coming up in that net. And these guys were knocking those things off into the coolers, and, and they just kept coming and kept coming. I, they must have been well over 100 salmon just while we were driving up behind them. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I would not have thought from our experience and from what I'm seeing around me today that there would have been a fish within 100 miles of here. This was total desolation. But what the, the Lord opened my eyes in that moment, and I realized I was in a sanctuary moment. Things happen like that sometimes. And, and as I was watching this scene, what I was really seeing 
was the fact that to the natural eye, nothing was happening. But beneath the surface, there was frenetic activity like you wouldn't believe. There were probably tens of thousands of these salmon coming in on the salmon run, and these guys were strategic in what they were doing, and they lowered a net into that. We had been fishing by using the attraction model, where we'd use something flashy, something that, that looked like food, something that, that appealed to the innate desires of a fish. But that fish had to use volition to take our offering. And we'd had five days where that wasn't happening. But in this moment, these guys, regardless of how it looked out there, were dropping the net into the migration. Now, what the Lord laid in my heart was this. And, and I, being a, a preacher, I guess you always are looking for sem- sermon illustrations. But what I saw was this, that sometimes we make the mistake of using the attraction model when God has a better plan. We want to hire Steve Stunning to preach and draw the crowds. We want to do everything we can to draw people in and because of their desires and their needs and their wants and all the rest of it when God has a better plan than that. And God's plan is what Jesus, back when Jesus, Jesus' ministry was bookended by the use of nets on both ends. The first thing we see, the first miracle that we see is over in Luke 5 when Jesus comes along one day and he's preaching by the seashore. And the crowds are pressing in on him. And so he asks Peter, who happens to be right there in his boat. He's come in from a night's fishing. He's doing the thing that fishermen do. He's cleaning his nets and he's getting ready uh, to get some rest and go back out again and fish overnight. And Jesus asked him if he could stand in his boat. And, and he gave him permission to do that. And Jesus preaches. And then when Jesus is done preaching, he asks Peter, he says, would you just take the boat out of deeper water for a while? And and oh, while we're here, just, just drop your net in for a catch. And Peter's going, that doesn't work. That, we, don't, we don't do that. There's no fish going to be caught here in the middle of the day. And there's no lights to attract them. And this is not going to work, but he does it anyway. Because Jesus seems to know what he's talking about. He drops it in. And the next thing you know, there's so many fish in this net that he's trying to pull in, and he starts yelling to his buddies to come and come, and the net starts breaking, and then what fish they do get in the boat is so voluminous that the boat begins to sink, and the other boats come, and they have the same issues. They did get a, car- a harvest that day, but they lost a bunch. And at the end of Jesus' ministry, when he's already been resurrected, crucified and resurrected, again, the fishermen are out fishing. They caught nothing all night. They come to shore, and, and, and Jesus asked them, have you caught any fish? They don't recognize him. Have you caught any fish? And they say, no, we fished all night and caught nothing. He says, drop your net on the right side, and you will find some. And so they, they I mean, they're conditioned now to do that. They see they've done it before. Uh, and so they drop the net, and sure enough, they catch so many fish, they can't hardly haul it in. Of course, the beauty of that was that Peter, the captain of that boat, probably the same boat that Jesus was preaching from that time, probably the same net that they had used before, which had been repaired. But in this particular instance, Peter was a man with guilt because he had denied the Lord three times, which in his culture meant that's the way it is. It's established. But here he was in the, in the presence of Jesus again, and he realizes who he's dealing with because John had said, it's the Lord, Peter. Peter throws on his coat because they fished practically naked, and he threw on his, his outer garment and swam to Jesus. And Jesus restored him and put him back in the, in the ministry and literally put him in charge of feeding the sheep. And so we see at the, at the, at the bookends of Jesus' life, this net was portrayed. And I've thought about this so many times, and I, I began to kind of study that because when you think about it, you're dropping this basically semi-permeable membrane into the water 
it, it works best when it's somewhat invisible, but yet it's passive. It's there all the time when, they, when they're fishing, and the fish just move into it, and they don't even know they're being caught until they're being reeled in. And I started studying on this and studying that whole concept, and, and I came to a, to a moment where the Lord showed me something that I had never seen before. This was a couple of years later. I'd been studying this whole thing, and uh, one of the references that I ran in, in, in studying this took me to Ephesians chapter 4. And I'm going to read that to you, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11, and we'll go down as far as 16. And this is a familiar passage that we have, and it's related because the same word for mending nets is used in this particular verse. Verse 11 says, and he himself, that is the Lord, you can always tell if it's, if it's the Lord in most of your translations if, it, if the, it's capitalized. And so, he himself there means Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why did he give them? For the equipping of the saints. And the word equipping there is the same word that's used for mending nets. It's also used for setting a broken bone. It's also used for taking a derelicted ship and re-outfitting it to do what it's designed to do. So it's re restoration in, in a very real sense. But the equipping of the saints is done so that they can do the work of the ministry. For the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ till we all come of a, to a unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. To a perfect man, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. By the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitfulness, of, pro of plotting. So... The whole idea here is this, and that somehow we've forgotten this, I think, and, you know, John was trying to recruit a bunch of people to help on, on, on this day of cleaning and so forth, and it kind of points out the facts. It's hard for one man to do what it takes many people to do. And so the idea here is this. We always celebrate the, 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 the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the pastors and the teachers. And in our culture, we've come to moments where basically it's almost like a spectator sport to come to church. We come and watch the paid performers perform. That's not the plan. That is not the plan. The plan is that we come like fish being harvested out of the water, and we begin to be part of the plan. We, be we begin to be people that are recruited into the ministry, and it's almost like we're being woven together as a net to be dropped back into the sea, and there's a, there's a basically a parable that Jesus taught, and it's over in Matthew 13, and I think it would be good for us to read that one today. Matthew 13, uh, and I believe it's 47, yeah, here it is, 47, 1347, Matthew, and it says this, and again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind. And when it was full, they drew it to shore, they sat down and gathered the good into vessels and threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and separate the wicked from among the just and cast them into a furnace of fire, and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So we have this picture again of a net uh, being thrust into the, to the world or, or the sea, as it were, the sea. Uh, typologically in the Bible, always refers to the mass of humanity. And this net is being dropped into that to harvest what God wants. Now, a net normally is designed 
for a certain catch. In other words, the gill netters that we talked about in British Columbia, they would use a net most of the time made of, of monofilament. It's almost invisible. And, and, and the opening in that net would be something like this because they weren't wanting to catch the herring that the, the salmon fed on. They were not wanting to catch other small fish. They wanted to catch salmon. And so that was designed so that a salmon, a, a decent-sized salmon, and certainly the larger ones in, in, as well, when they, when they would be swimming into that net, their head would go into it, and then their gills would catch on that, and then they could be harvested. But all the other stuff would just go right through the net and never, never be caught. And so the idea is, in effect, that the, the Holy Spirit has been given charge of setting the net and it's setting the net in the, in the sea of mankind. And one day, after it's all said and done, the angels will, will sort the harvest, according to this parable. So we have this picture, and I don't think I'm stretching it biblically to say to you, I believe the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is the net. Here's the thing. Another thing that happened to me that I have never forgotten, I was studying this. In fact, I was studying this one day. I was sitting in a church, and it was so boring that I was studying on my own. I'm sorry to say this pastor, he could have been tried for preaching and gone scot-free for lack of evidence. It was terrible. <laughs> kind of like this morning, but I, I was there. And I, I started, I was losing track of him, and I, and I just started studying on this, and the Lord just opened it to me, and I just, I, I mean, I saw it, and I was excited about it. And about two weeks later, I was in the Fiji Islands, and um, my dad was, after he retired, he went over there, and he was the Associate Peace Corps Director in the Fiji Islands, and I was going to visit him. And we got up early one morning, one of the first days I was there, and had caught a flight to one of the adjacent islands where he was working on projects with villagers. And it was early morning, and I began to uh, walk along. He was doing what he was doing, and I was just kind of walking, checking things out. And the local fishing fleet had come in that morning to the beach, and they were unloading their boats and their nets, and there were all of these structures built on the shoreline that there were just row after row after row of these uh, little little railings that were built with two by fours they'd, they'd plant them in the sand and then they built long rails and all these nets were draped over these rails and and they're drying and and guys were and the fishermen were walking through those nets and they would they would pluck off all the seaweed or or the moss, or whatever, whatever was on those nets, because they knew they need to be as invisible as possible uh, to work properly. And so I was watching this one particular fisherman that was closest to where I was, and he was walking through the nets, just row after row, and he would stop every so often and, and test the net. You would see something that, that, that his practiced eye thought was a problem, potentially. See, if the net breaks with it, when it's full of fish, it's bad. You know, one little, one little weak place in the net, when they're pulling the fish out of the water, that weight will break that place. And then it's almost, if you watch it underwater, it's like a funnel because the, the weight of the fish find that opening and they open it further and it, it just it gets bigger and you just lose all that you came for. And so he knows that, and so he finds the weak spots, and he would test them. And ever so often, one was broken, or, or it would break in his hands, and he would reach in his pocket, and he would pull out this little, little tool about three to four inches long. I would love to have seen it up close, but I'd love to have gotten one of them just for the memory of it all. But, but he would take that little thing. It looked like it was carved out of bone, and he would take the loose ends and join all four of those pieces together and make, a, and make a new knot. They would test it. And then he would determine it's ready for the sea. I thought to myself, if ever I have seen a picture of pastoring, that's it. I can't come to a church anymore without seeing you draped on these chairs 
like the net that you are. When I preach, when I hear Pastor Josh preach, I see the same thing happening because we've come to mend the net. We've come to take loose ends and get them joined back together again. We've come to equip you to do the work of the ministry. Whether you're helping with children, whether you're being an usher, whether you're being a greeter, or whether you're just being an attendee that loves people and, and greets people and, and embraces people, you are doing the work of the ministry. But tomorrow morning, or maybe this evening if your schedule is that way, you're going to go back into the sea. The net is going to spend some time in the boat, and it's going to spend some time on the shore, but it's made for the sea. You come into your own when you're out of here. You go into the environment where God has placed you, and you need to be as sticky as possible. It's a phrase I see in business these days where people talk about being sticky. So when people contact, when they run into us, they, they stick. Churches need to be sticky. We don't need to be fancy. We don't need to be trendy. We need to be sticky. We need to be people that people want to be around. We want to be people that are full of God and full of the Holy Spirit and, and, and functioning in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So we're ready to do what needs to be done when we get where we're supposed to be going. People think I'm doing great because I'm going to church. Hello, you're just on the rack here. This isn't the goal. This is the place that equips you to be what you're supposed to be when you get out there. And when you're out there, the job is bring them in here so we can incorporate them into the kingdom of God. In fact, one of the things that happens on the rack after they have put the net in good shape is that they add more net to catch more fish, to feed more people. The whole process is to be ongoing. So the Lord is, is so excited about seeing people do what they're called to do. One of the analogies that we run into here in, in the, the book of Ephesians, let me just take you down to verse, I'll oh, just go to verse 15, the very next one. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes the growth of the body for the edifying of itself, for the building up of itself in love. This verse was a verse, especially the verse, I would say, that when we planted this church with four families and no money, the Lord gave me this verse as the plan. I, I, I never really noticed that verse before, to be honest with you. But when we came, we didn't have a staff. We didn't have hardly anything. And what the Lord taught me was that this is the natural progression of preaching the gospel. That the gospel will turn observers and listeners into ministers. And we began to see that happen. And we, we grew to 700 people with myself only as a full-timer, had a part-time secretary and a part-time music director. And we saw the church grow to 700 people. That, that group of people gave the money and we were able to buy this 17 acres here for cash in the second year of our operation and build a $2.5 million building without ever having anybody have to sign a loan. And that just can't happen. But something happens when God gets a hold of a people and he begins to equip people and people begin to see themselves not as spectators but as participants. 
And over the years, we've hired very, 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 very few people outside of the church to be pastors here because God raised people up and equipped people and people had the right heart and they were committed to do things and, and it's just been that way. And I'm thankful for that. But as I look out on this group today, I, I can tell you this. There are people sitting in this room that are carrying stuff that God wants this church to experience. There are folks here that love kids. And people are bringing their children because they don't know how to raise them in many cases. They, they've, they've got issues in their life and they're, and they're trying to make sure their kids are in an environment where somebody can teach them right. And they, while they're being taught, the most valuable ministry in the church to me and has always been the place where we put our money, the, the vast majority of our budget has always gone to the children. Because that's the future. Because they're vulnerable. They can't help themselves. They need to, to rely on us. If you have a heart for God, you ought to have a heart for children. It's one thing to feel something for them. It's another thing altogether to say, I'm going to volunteer. I, I'm going to put my, I'm going to get that plow and I'm going to plow a straight furrow for God. I'm going to invest myself. I love Jesus. I'm going to invest my Jesus in these kids. Or maybe you love to be with youth. Same thing. Or maybe you love elderly people and you really want to be a help, help to them. The most vulnerable among us deserve the greatest attention. You, you see what I'm saying? And, and the Lord is very straightforward here about this. Listen to this one, one more time. The whole body joined and knit together, knit together by what every joint supplies. And the analogy of the body is very, very perfect here. We are the body of Christ. Christ is the head. And I was thinking about this the other day. You know, if I, if my brain says, you know, Gary, you, you need a drink of water. There's, there's water. Go ahead and pick that up. And my brain's telling me to do that, but my, my arm and my shoulder and my hand, the, the, the nerves somehow are not, not getting that message to my hand or my hand is unable to respond. What do we call that? Paralysis. So the body of Christ, I'm afraid, in many cases has... Paralysis. What the Lord is telling us to do, we are wired to do, but we're not doing it. You know, you, you could have gone anywhere and been beat up today, and I'm just beating you up really good. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. When I understand that it is not optional for me to obey the Lord... I begin to grow. And the cool thing about this is what God is investing in me, if it ends with me, I'm a poor steward. And there's a parable or two that talk about the, the issue with that. If, if God gives me assets and I squander them on myself or refuse to invest them, he takes them away and gives them to somebody that will. We could go there in that parable and spend quite a little time. But the facts are that what God is pouring into you is not just for your consumption. What God is pouring into us, we become stewards of and become responsible for. And as, as part of the body of Christ, we need to be functioning according to the way the Lord is speaking to us. Now, what I have found is this. You know, we've been talking a lot about a laid-down life. A laid-down life is scary sometimes. And a laid-down life is one that we, we subjugate our will to the will of our Father. And as somebody who's walked into several scenarios in life like that, that are way, way above my pay grade, I can tell you it is so scary sometimes 
to, to take your hands off the wheel and let the Lord drive. And you don't feel you can. You don't feel you're up to it. But God is inviting you into a space that you've never inhabited before, and he's going to give you grace to do things that you would never have been able to do. And this will, this will take you way beyond where you've ever been in, in your life with Jesus. And it's such an exciting thing, guys. I've got to tell you, I haven't lived, Josh said the other, the other day, 75 years, and I'm mid-70s, and I... You know, I'm about extinguished and all the rest of that, but, but I'm not. But in, in my many years, I have found this to be true. When God invites me to do something I don't think I can do, I'm getting ready to come up a notch. I'm getting ready to experience grace to do something that I'm not capable of doing. And then guess who gets the credit? It's so fun. It is so exciting. I, I, would, I would like to have 10 lives to do it more. I really would. But what I'm doing at this point in my life is I'm trying to encourage as many people as I can, do not let yourself fall into lethargy and just enjoy. You're carriers or something. And like that dragnet being put into the sea, you're there to make a harvest. We're all going to stand before the Lord someday and give account for what we've done with what's been done for us. I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter to the joy of the Lord. And I want to be there standing and hear him say the same thing over you. And you want to stand there and hear him say the same thing over those you've met. This is, this is so exciting when you really realize we're part of this economy called the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, there's no votes taken. The king never takes a vote. He issues a command. And servants do what he commands. The kingdom of God is not a democracy. It's not a republic. We're not declaring our independence from him. We're, we're declaring our servanthood to him. And it's such an exciting thing when you realize this is the best one to serve. He's good. He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He wants to load you daily with benefits. He wants to open your eyes to the wonder of following the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He wants to fill your hands with power. He wants to fill your heart with love. He wants to fuel you with passion, not fear and regret. And it's all there for us, but, but we've got to make space for him. You know, I, when, I, when I talk about this Fijian fisherman, it just, it just really, it thrills me. It thrills me to be able to even do a little bit of what that guy was doing. I've lived long enough and I've pastored long enough that I've been able to see people that came in broken and I never thought would be able to do anything in life. I've seen them become business owners. I've seen them become teachers. I've seen them come into the ministry. I've seen them do all kinds of things because they just gave God what they had and God saw them faithful with what they had and he gave them more and when they were faithful with that, he gave them more and when they were faithful with that, he gave them more. Like any good parent would do, you don't trust your child with a fortune when they've never even learned to budget the nickel or the dime or the dollar that they had before. It just works that way. And for people that are saying, I just, I just feel like I'm stuck in God. I just don't feel like I've grown for a long time. I've, I've grown cold. I've, grown, I've fallen asleep in the spirit. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not moving. Well, here's the thing. Do something with what you've got. 
Don't go from church to church carrying your roots around in a pot, sitting them down and getting a little bit here and a little bit there. And you know, Invest yourself someplace, here or somewhere else. Invest yourself someplace. God didn't call you to be a connoisseur of preaching. He called you to be a practitioner of what's preached. What a joy it is to hear God say something from his word and see it lived out in your life. You know, a man with experience is never at the mercy of a man with a theory. God wants us to have experience. He wants us to feel the power of God surging through us to pray for somebody. He wants us to be able to stand beside a hospital bed and and lay our hands on somebody's fevered head and see them healed. He wants us to be able to, to be at work someday and, and somebody that, that's been hard to live with at work suddenly opens up to the gospel and, 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 and responds to the kindness you've shown them. I remember when I was in Bible college, I worked for UPS and, and, and also for United Airlines. And, and in the break rooms, you get to know your workers. And you hear all their stories and all their conquests and all the stuff that they're doing. And they, they, they like to make fun of you if you're a Christian in many cases. I remember going through some of those conversations and putting up with a, a lot of ribbing and all that kind of thing for being the preacher and all that sort of stuff. But I also remember the days when I didn't join them in this or that thing they were doing. I remember the days when somebody would in the break room, wait around until everybody else was gone and say, hey, I, I really need to talk to you about this. I really need to ask you some questions. I'm going through this or that or the other thing. That's when you know they're caught in the net. That's when you know. I'm just telling you, you're always on duty. You're always being watched. Light shines in the dark, and darkness can't overcome it. If you're carriers of the glory of God, it's great to show it here, but it's essential to show it there. When you're here, we're glad to join in, rejoice together. We're glad to be taught together. We're glad to fellowship because we're all kind of heading in the same direction And it's perfect and it's important and it needs to be and we need to do more of it. The Bible says don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is and especially as the day approaches. We're we're on the cusp of something, my friends. There's a reset going on in the world. I feel like that day back at Rivers Inlet. Can't see very far right now. Things seem strange. Seem like nothing's happening except strange. But I can tell you by the word of the Lord, there is a frenetic activity going on under the surface. People don't know what to trust. They don't know who to trust. But you can trust him. And when, he see, when they see us trusting him, there's going to be a moment when they run for cover. There's going to be a moment when they talk to people that seem to have their head on the street. There's going to be a moment when their kids come home and say, well, I'm just thinking I'm actually not a boy. I'm a girl now. Or I'm a puppy or whatever it is this week. They're looking for somebody it's got their head in the right place. We don't have to be judgmental. The Holy Spirit is doing that. The Holy Spirit's the one that draws all men to Christ, but he can't draw them directly to Christ. He has to draw them to a Christ follower. That's the way it works. Somebody that can tell them the plan of salvation. Somebody that can pray with them. Oh, the Lord can save them sovereignly. That, that wasn't an accurate statement. But the bottom line of this thing is he chooses to use you and me. He says, you go, therefore, and preach. Tell people about me. 
Be there to pull in the net. Be there to be a facilitator of kingdom activity. Lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. There's nobody else going to get that command and do it except the body of Christ. I want to encourage you today that you're sufficient for the things God asks you to do. By the grace that he gives us, you have what you need. You have more than you think you need. Why don't you stand with me this morning?